What's going on, guys? Welcome into episode number 38 of The Ask Tony Show. Thank you so much for being here. Another day, another awesome, amazing guest. Uh, as you guys know, the reason why I started doing interviews in the first place is because I like to find people that do extraordinary things and bring them on the show so that you guys can meet them, so that myself included, we can be motivated, inspired, and they can also teach us a thing or two about what they do. So today's guest, guys, is no exception. I have known her for the vast majority of my life, and she is a perfect example of entrepreneurship, of leadership, of long-term vision. You know, it's someone that has been doing small and simple things for a long time, and that's the reason why she's here and why I'm so excited to talk to her. Uh, so Magali Ortiz Gris, I wasn't sure if I should say Ortiz Gris or Ortiz Gris. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't sure how to say your last name, but Magali, thank you so much for being here. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, what you're about. All right. No, thank you, Tony, for giving me this opportunity to be here and share a little bit about my story. Um, like he said, my name is Magali Ortiz Gris. I am 27 years old um, from the beautiful city of Querétaro in Mexico. Um, I came here to the U.S. when I was nine. Um, I'm a, an Herbalife independent distributor and um, a co-owner of a protein bar here in Orem. And I'm really excited to tell you guys what I do, what I've been through, give you guys a little bit of um, insight or tips into the MLM world. Um, but yeah, thank you, Tony. Yeah, no, thank you so much for being here. And, you know, I talk to a lot of young people who want to be entrepreneurs. Every week I get 20 to 30 DMs of people that want to start some sort of business. And so... When I, when I take a look at kind of the people that are around me, I don't know too many people under 30 that have actually built something substantial. It's actually pretty rare. It's, it's, it's more rare than I would like it to be. I wish that there was like more young people that, that could actually, you know, build something substantial. But you are a tremendous example of being able to build something starting small and then now, you know, growing it to something uh, much bigger, which we're going to talk about. But, you know... I remember, you know, back in the day, uh, you've always been in Herbalife. And so we're going to talk yeah. a little bit about the MLM industry as a whole. But first of all, just kind of tell us a little bit about your background when you guys got into it. I know that your parents uh, do it and they've been doing it for a long time as well. So tell us a little bit about that, what that was like growing up, when, when your family started and kind of where this whole Herbalife train uh, took off for you guys. All right. Uh, well, my parents started giving me the products literally when I was three years old. Um, before school, my mom used to give it to me in like a bottle. Yeah, I still had my bottle when I was three. <laughs> um, it's literally all I've ever known. Um, they started their business in Mexico. And I remember they would take me to their little like shake parties. I'd be in charge of handing out like the cups to people. Um, for the most part, it was really boring for me, but since I didn't, we didn't have like a babysitter or anything, I would just tag along with them. The only thing I do remember is they couldn't take me to trainings, you know, because kids couldn't go to trainings. And I kind of hated Herbalife for that because they would take away my parents. Um, but then I started growing, we came here to the US uh, my parents were still doing Herbalife, but not full time. Um, but they would still take me with them. I remember the summers, it was just going to knock doors, which I freaking hated. Um, because that's what we could do back then. You know, there wasn't social media. Um, all it was was word of mouth or who do you know? And in the summers, we would go knock doors, offering people like wellness evaluations, um, and then when I finally turned 15, I was able to start going to the trainings, which were a little bit more fun. Um, but yeah, my parents would give me like $2 if I helped them like weigh people or just simple stuff like that. Sometimes I would, I remember when we first came to the U.S., I started um, stapling like Tootsie Rolls 
to like flyers and like with a rubber band and we would go house to house and just put them like in the doorknobs and we added the little candy just so um people would actually kind of look at it because if not they would throw it away <laughs> so our house was full of tootsie rolls <laughs> that's awesome that is awesome yeah and actually i uh, I know your parents well, and I think that that is such a cool thing that, you know, they started their business and they've been at it for decades and they, they found ways to include their kids as a part of their business. You know, I know a lot of parents that are entrepreneurs and very, very few actually include their children in the day to day. So I love that story about, you know, them taking you door to door, finding things for you to do like that is extraordinary like and not only just the fact of including you but being willing to you know go door to door you know knock you know go out and talk to people especially coming from you know from mexico coming here you're in a new country and just having that drive and that motivation to do those little things i think is absolutely extraordinary so um your parents they have been in it ever since you were just a little kid uh, talk a little bit about how, you know, they have influenced you into now when maybe it's still a family business, but you're a little bit more independent. Talk to us uh, about maybe individually, your mom and your dad, how they have influenced you uh, into the way that you run your business today. Uh, well, mostly just seeing um, how they build a little community with the people here because we came here we didn't know anyone um and there's so many people like us that come to this country and you know all their families are back in their um home countries and i just i loved that my parents were able to build friendships and make people it, it wasn't all about oh let me sell you this shake or oh um lose weight like it was actually like being there for people and to be honest it was my only option because as an immigrant in this country you know you don't have the necessary paperwork to be able to go apply at Kohl's or Wendy's um so I saw that my parents put a lot of effort like my I would see my dad he would go to there used to be this Mexican store here in Orem called Tenochtitlan he would go there every single day and hand out flyers. It was the summer. And if you and if you know my dad, my dad is always wearing like um, dress shirts. He's never a, he has never been a very casual guy. Yeah. Uh, so he is there with like his um, his fancy shirt and tie and just giving out flyers. What I admire about my parents is that they never gave up. And if we because this was. This is what brought food to our home. Like they had to go sell, like even if it was just like some multivitamins, like they couldn't come home without selling something because, you know, rent had to be paid, food needed to be on the table. And that is something I always admired from my parents, and especially the language barrier, you know, so they were always scouting for the Latinos like, oh, um, do you speak Spanish? And then they would, you know, talk to them and that's something I admire from my parent, my parents, that they never gave up, that they, yeah, they always gave it their all, no matter what. I love that. I love that. That is, that is such a cool story. Uh, so, so big ups to your parents, um, and to you, you know, for, for being willing to learn and contribute to, to what, as you say, a family business is the way you guys made your living. Um, and so, one of the other kind of aspects that, that sometimes I see when it comes to family businesses, because family businesses, I feel like has an extra layer of difficulty in building a family business. There's a lot of emotion there, you know, as people that you love. And so all of a sudden there's disagreements or, you know, it's, it's one thing if you have an employee and you tell them what to do versus it's your son or it's your mom or your dad. So, uh, and so what I've seen often ends up happening is the kids don't want to then participate in the business once they get older. Maybe they have to when they're kids because they're forced to, but as soon as they can get out, they find their way out. So talk to us a little bit about what motivated you to stay in the family business and grow it even more versus doing something else. Uh, I think what really got me interested or like, okay, I want to do this. Um, I, 
I wanted to open up my own like little protein bar back then. They weren't called protein bars. It was just like a little nutrition club. That's what we called them. Um, my parents sent me to Texas for like three months during um, one summer. And I studied how they did like their nutrition clubs there. And I seriously came back like, wow, like this is so cool. Because, you know, I, I was always at my parents' little shop and I didn't think it was cool or anything like that. I was just like, oh, this is kind of lame. But then I saw all their people doing it and different ways that they did it. And I'm like, OK, I want to make my little shop like this, like this and like this, like nothing like my parents, mm -hmm. but I wanted to make it my own. I I was 18 when I first opened my first nutrition club, and that's really what kind of kept me there. But I never really did it full time. It was always like a part time kind of thing. Um, just recently, I, I can say that I have done it full time. Um, 2019 was my year when I was like, OK, either I go look for another job or I get my butt up and start working. And I'm here now and I have literally seen the results just from like a mind focus, like even if it was just like a little bit, how how much you can receive with just a little bit of focus and um, hard work. Yeah, I love that. And actually a little bit later in the show, we're going to talk about how you've taken your concept of your MLM and turned it into something completely new, which I think is absolutely brilliant. Um, but first of all, I wanted to ask you about your industry because I have some beef with the MLM industry and I've talked about this before and very few MLM people want to come on my show because they know that I'm going to ask them tough questions. So, uh, I admire you for being here and for being willing <laughs> to get grilled on MLM. But basically here's my take on MLM. I believe, I don't believe MLM is a scam. I don't think it's an illegal pyramid scheme. I think it's a legit business. So I'll give you points there. I think your business is <laughs> legit. Some people don't think your business is legit. I think your business is legit. But here's where I have a problem. I have a problem with the way MLM is sold, with the way the recruiters push it to people, with you know promising them millions of dollars if they can just recruit two people. And it just seems like there's a lot of fluff and there's not a lot of actual tangible sales training, at least at first. I've talked to a lot of MLM people and they're like, yeah, well, once, once you're in it, they teach you how to sell. But, you know, the, the, the failure rate, I think it's like 97% failure rate in MLM people that never make any money. And I, I, I don't blame it on the industry because while the opportunity is legit and the math is there, I feel like there's not a good foundation in the way that it's sold and people really don't know what they're getting themselves into when they first start out. So to that, you say what? I think you're absolutely right. MLMs are freaking hard. Um, people, like you say, they sell as a um, get rich quick and it's the complete opposite. Um, they're freaking hard. You being your own boss is so much harder than being an employee because when you're an employee, they tell you, okay, you check it, you clock in at six, um, your lunch is at 12 and you get out at five or whatever. And then you earn this much, um, your check is going to be here next week at this time, blah, blah, blah. But when you're your own boss, you have to be so strict with yourself, but then I feel like in MLMs, we get into this mentality like, oh, I am my own boss. Um, I have no hours. I can do whatever I want. And what I kind of hate about MLMs too is that they're so pushy. I I am an, an MLM, but like I see other MLM posts or even like distributors in like Herbalife mm -hmm. and Dude, I'm like embarrassed. Like, like it's what are like you doing, man? <laughs> it's like secondhand embarrassment. Like I tell my distributors, like, okay, for example, I like, I don't like being sold to, but I like to buy. So, cause I, I am so against being pushy or like, oh, Hey, join my team. Like you're gonna, you're gonna make, um, like 500 bucks, like your first week. Like, no, like you're not. <laughs> Yeah. Like maybe you yeah. are if you're like badass. Yeah. 
I love that. That <laughs> that is that's the key. It's just yeah, MLMs are just looked at in such a bad way, and I feel bad because there's such a huge opportunity for different opportunity for different kinds of MLM. I'm not saying like, oh, like this is the only one, like you can only make money in this one. Like there are so many, like, honestly, like I might even start my own one, like just selling toilet paper. <laughs> like <laughs> there's an MLM for everything and like everything works if you put the work in it. And if you are patient, persistent, but it's not just a, oh, get your cousin and your mom to sign under you. And then you're going to have a $200 check um, tomorrow. No, yeah. I, I hate yeah. that. I hate the aspect of MLMs. Yeah. And so I feel like the people that are in it don't do themselves any favors because you guys get a bad rap because of the way that it's sold. But yes. within your communities, there's a legit people like they're they're real entrepreneurs within your ranks. But I feel like the rotten apples around that do all that kind of stuff that you're talking about, they kind of mess it up for the rest of you. So that was one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on. But it was, it was because you're one of the few people that I know that have actually lived off of MLM for an extended period of time in the same one. I've known people that jump into one and they do good for a little bit and then they're out and then they're doing another one. So it's rare to see somebody uh, that is doing it in a, in a family business way that actually that is their main source of income for 20 plus years. So that's the reason why I wanted to bring you on to kind of show the audience that, you know, MLM has legit people in it. And if you just kind of brush it off as this pyramid scheme or this scam and it doesn't work and it's all BS, then I think that there are people out there that could be successful, that could put in the work, but they they have this image that it's it's that it's not a good thing, right? And so that's kind of my take on MLM. Um, also, because I really like the whole training aspect, which I feel like doesn't exist in other businesses. If you start a bakery or if you start selling clothes, like. In most cases, you're going to be all by yourself. But what MLM, I think, really contributes is that sense of community and that sense of training. And in your case, I mean, you guys fly all over the place. You've probably been to every state in the United States. Um, every time I go on my Instagram, you're in a different state, like doing trainings and meeting people and stuff. And so that's kind of the next point that I wanted to talk about is personal development, which that's one of the things that I admire about your industry is that focus on personal development. So talk to us a little about uh, a little bit about what personal development you consume when you started, how you discovered it and what difference has that made uh, in your life and in your business? Um, my first thought of when it, when you said when I was first like exposed to it, I guess I've been exposed to it like all my life, but when I, when I really think about it is that summer that my parents took me knocking door to door. We were in the car and all we would listen to was Les Brown. I seriously have all, well, I guess it was CDs back then. I have all his CDs memorized because that's all we would listen to. And it was so annoying because I just wanted to listen to some music. But I understand my parents now because selling or trying to sell is such a mental thing such a mental battle that you literally have to be strong like mentally because you're gonna get so many no's and people being rude to you that you literally have to be like okay no like this this many people said no but the next one's gonna say yes just having a positive um mentality i really like uh jim Rohn. He's one of my favorites, Les Brown, because he's like engraved here. <laughs> um, and I think personal development is so important because without it, I don't think you can get very far. I agree. You know, there's there just our mind is so complex and we need to grow every day. And especially um, being our own boss. No one is going to be, no one is going to be telling you like, oh yeah, you got it. Like, unless, you know, you have awesome people around you, but it's, it's honestly a mental battle and personal development has helped me so much. Just trying to push my boundaries, like get out of my comfort zone. Um, just listening it to over and over again, like, oh, if you want things to change, you have to change. Like 
Things are not going to get better if you keep doing the same thing over and over. Um, I like to listen to audios in the morning um, just while I'm doing different things. Because if I sit down and read a book, like my mind just goes everywhere. Um, so audios are a huge for me. Um, they just get your day off on a good note, I feel like. Yeah, no, I, I tend to listen to, to audiobooks more than I read uh, as well. And so I, I, I completely agree. And that's, that's the point, isn't it? Like the point is, this is hard. Like it's not easy, guys. Like people that are listening, building a business is tough. You know, I'm in real estate, you're in MLM. Like this stuff is not as easy as people think. And especially in, in, in today's day and age, everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. Everybody wants to be a business owner. Everybody wants, but guys, it's not that simple. But the good thing is that, as we were mentioning prior, there are good people that can help you along the path. And these people like Les Brown, you know, Jim Rohn, Tony Robbins, you know, their, their, their concepts are going to help you be better because it's hard. And you're going to, just like you said, you're going to run into those mental roadblocks and you have to find something to help you get over it. Not only in developing your skills, but just in knowing how to properly contextualize experiences that happen to you so that you don't get down. Because I, I experienced the exact same thing when I was a brand new agent, it was, it was more no's than yeses. And that was really tough to be able to handle. So, um, is there like a particular book, uh, an audio that you've listened to recently, uh, that the audience can plug into one that maybe comes to mind that you, that you really liked? Um, I think I have two, um, but my first one that really um, opened my mind was by Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Like seriously, just the first chapters, it's like, that's all you need to read. Like you don't even need to finish yeah. the book. <laughs> yeah, that's a crazy book. It's like, it, it's so amazing. Like just simple stuff that you think like, oh yeah, that's a cool fact, but really like, if you if you're in sales or if you want to be in sales and you want to be like a people person like I'm so shy but if there's so many great books out there like that one that will be like okay if you do this this is going to happen right. and like this is going to give you closer get you closer to making that sell or making that other person like you I think that is a number one for anyone in whichever industry that they are in. And also my second favorite one is by Esther Hicks, um, Ask and It Is Given. Um, I'm really into like meditation and like um, affirmations right now. And that is such an awesome book or the audios. Um, I feel like those would be my two recommendations. Awesome. awesome. Guys, check it out. I haven't read the second one. I have read Dale Carnegie multiple times. That is an incredible book. Even if you're not an entrepreneur, it just helps you like have more friends and have people like you more. Uh, so check out that book. That book is tremendous. But one of the things that I wanted to, to, to ask you specifically is you are tremendously shy. Like you yeah. are one of the shyest humans that I know. And so that makes it even more extraordinary um, for the audience, kind of some, 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 some context, some uh, top secret information is Magali and I, for a long time, we danced in the same dance group and, you know, she was super shy. She'd get very nervous when we had shows and stuff like that. And so I know that you are extremely shy. And so, you know, entrepreneurship is not for shy people, especially when you talk about, you got to go knock on doors, you got to talk to people, you got to sell, you got to do this. Like shy people, um, if you don't have the ability to kind of go outside yourself and communicate, it's very tough for a shy person to succeed. So how have you kind of gone, gotten over that? Uh, is that something that you still struggle with? And at what point did you kind of realize, all right, like if I keep this up, I'm not going to win the way that I want to. Um, honestly, like the tea, I still struggle with it every day. Like even just before this, I was like, I was so stressed all day and just <laughs> nervous. Like I was like, oh my gosh, like it's today. Um, it's just like, and that's why I do so much personal development because if not, I seriously would not get out of my room and I would just live there and never get out. Um, 
I think the the time that I was like, okay, I have to change because if not, I'm going to be living in my same situation 10 years from now. I think it was beginning of 2020, to be honest. Um, we had recently gotten our our restaurant license and I really needed to get out of my comfort zone because for so long, it was just my little Hispanic group, you know, the then the 10 um, old ladies that would come and have their shake. And if I wanted things to change, I had to do different things. So one of the biggest things that has helped me has been um, my partner, Charlie. If it wasn't for him pushing me constantly out of my comfort zone, I think we wouldn't be here right now. Um, having someone that's going to keep you accountable and literally hold you accountable, like telling you like your shit, like, hey, you're getting comfy. Like, come on, get up. Let's do new things. Um, numbers are going down. What are you doing to bring them up? Um, I think that has helped me a lot get out of my comfort zone because I have seen the fruits of my labor literally from stepping out of my comfort zone. Um, just knowing that if I do what scares me the most, which is just talking to people or yeah, just literally talking to people, then I'm going to get closer to my goal or where I want to be. But if I'm still just shy, not doing anything about it, I'm just going to be stuck. And if I want to grow, if I want to experience new things, have more things, more materialistic things, um, travel, all that is on the other side of talking to people. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And so, guys, in the audience, if you're shy, that's okay. Like, everybody has their flaws. But what you can't do is you can't allow that flaw to keep you static, where it doesn't, it doesn't let you move forward. And when, when we had the call to prep for the show, you said something very interesting. And you touched on it just now, that at the core – you're still a shy person. You're still that, you know, introverted individual, but there's like this switch, right? There's like this, this like other alter ego that kind of checks in. I have the exact same thing, you know, and it, it, it almost becomes like, like a, like a character, at least, at least for me, like when I'm, yeah. when I'm doing these shows, when I'm in, in, the, in front of a client, when I'm giving a talk at a conference, it's like, it's literally like a character that I get into the zone and now it's, 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 it's outside of myself. So you mentioned that when we were prepping for the show. So tell us a little bit about that. Is that something that is conscious? Is that something that you learned? And how do you kind of flip that switch when you know that it's time to go? It honestly comes on when I know there's no one else that's going to cover for me. Um, like I am the only option is when this little switch inside me goes, okay, you need to talk now. And then, like I said, when we were prepping for, when you said that I, we were prepping for the show, um, I was talking about there's instances at our protein bar that I just start talking to people like I am the friendliest gal you've ever met, like shy, like what is that? And I step out of like that scenario and that inside I'm like, Wow, Magali, good job. Like, who would have known? Who would have known that you'd be twerking on your Instagram making protein waffles? I saw that. <laughs> what happened, you guys? Check her out. She was twerking on Instagram. I mean, th th this is an introvert, guys. This is a shy person. And she's twerking on Instagram making protein waffles. Eso pasó. Like, that is real. <laughs> oh, my God. You know, the funny thing about that is, you know, there's so many, there's so many moments where I'm like, oh, I wish people would see this is me or like, I'm not just some like, cause since I'm shy and I don't talk a lot, some people think I'm like stuck up, but I'm, I'm not, I'm just really shy. And with that video that you're mentioning, I was like, should I post it or not? Should I, it, it's so stupid. Should I post it? No. Cause what if they think this and that? I'm like, I'm just going to post it. Just and do I, it. Just do it. I just did it and I loved it and I will it do it awesome. again. <laughs> do it again. That was amazing. <laughs> so I no, I love that. I love that. And and props to you for, for taking what could be seen as a flaw 
and recognizing it, working on it, and then finding opportunities to kind of break that mold. I think that that is absolutely extraordinary. But you've mentioned your protein bar multiple times. And so I purposely saved this to the end, guys, because this to me is extraordinary. So, and I, I, I want to obviously ask you the specifics, but basically what this chick did is she had her MLM biz, which is Herbalife, which is shakes, bars, you know, fat burning stuff. Uh, and she turned it into a restaurant, which is insane to me. So talk to us a little bit about where that idea came from. Uh, how long did it take? Just kind of where the whole OVS um, thing was born. So originally it was um, just, my parents started it like 10 years ago. It was a way for people to try the products. Like we would make the shake for you um, and the tea, you know, just little samples. Um, and that's honestly how it stayed for the last 10 years. Just very quiet on the down low um, with the Latino community. Um, honestly, it was so ghetto. It, it was it was embarrassing like how could we have our business like this like <laughs> the green walls just like I remember that. I remember the green wall there was posters um, everywhere it posters was it, everywhere if there was like, if oh, just like no. there's a Disneyland guys if there was a Herbalife land it was it was it was this spot it was Herbalife land for sure it was Herbalife world it was like bombarding everywhere of Herbalife I love Herbalife just Every Herbalife everywhere in like pictures of like before and afters with like the frames broken, like, oh, it was just so <laughs> bad. And we didn't re like, I always knew it was kind of ghetto and, but I, I didn't put much thought into it until Charlie came. Charlie is the responsible one for literally like making this new baby that is now the OVS that everyone knows. Um, I always wanted to have, we say um, general market for the white people. I always wanted um, our club to be like a healthy Starbucks, you know, people coming in after school, working on their homework, sipping on something good. I always wanted that, but I didn't really know how to achieve that until Charlie came. And he's like, okay, we have to take down those ugly pictures. <laughs> we have to just like that. Yeah, no, he, he oh, he <laughs> hates those pictures. I love and now guy. I see them, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's so embarrassing. Because like people would come and be like, oh yeah, she's that lady. She's right there, and like the lady's like overweight now. <laughs> she stopped coming. She stopped coming. <laughs> Oh yeah, she 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 dropped off the wagon for like a couple of months, but she's back on. So bad, no. Um, yeah, we did a, a remodeling, but the thing that really kicked it off was getting the restaurant permits. Um, it took us all. It took us like six months because we never really closed the place because we still had like a customer base. So we did all the remodeling like after we closed or really early. But once we got the restaurant license, it was like, okay, it's go time. Let's get out in the community. Let's let everyone know that there's some really good stuff here. And I'm a very visual person. So I'm like, if I didn't know what this was, what would attract me? And since we live in Utah and there's like soda shops everywhere, like in every corner, it's like every church. <laughs> um, I'm like, OK, so people like drinks. Um, I want to make cool drinks that are healthy and give you energy, but that are also like Instagram worthy. And so we just started experimenting um, and we just made our products likable to the public without them being scared that it was Herbalife because if there was like Herbalife anywhere people would automatically be like oh no like they're just trying to recruit me right. like no 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 like dude this stuff is good just try it just try it. if you don't like it that's fine but just try it and that and that's it's so how... good guys it's <laughs> so good like and these drinks Again, follow, follow her because these drinks and that's that's the next thing that I, that I want to talk about is 
you know, going from an MLM to a restaurant is completely different game, but you know, like I have, I have it right here. Right. So there's, there's these drinks guys. And it's crazy because there's like different colors, but it's like the blue is up top and then like the red is down low and it like doesn't mix. Like it's not purple. It's like blue and red and it, there's like glitter in it. It's I've never seen anything like that. And then here. So I, I love the orange one. So there's like actual oranges in here. So just completely blown away by the presentation and the attention to detail. So where does that come from? Where does where does the idea of, you know, having the stickers on the on the cups and having actual oranges and orange juice. Um, talk to us a little bit about, about how you first thought about presenting and making these drinks that quite frankly, stand out a ton. I just wanted something different because um, in all the other nutrition clubs or like little herbalized spots, it was the really ugly styrofoam cup that, you know, you would have your tea there. And then after you're done with your tea, we would give you your shake in there. And it was just very boring and not pretty. But like I said, I'm very visual. So I'm like, okay, so people like going to Starbucks. They always take pictures of their cups. And actually with the logo, with the sticker, that was, that used to not be our logo. Someone stole my logo. <laughs> Like they, they copied it. So I had to make a new one. Shoot. <laughs> uh, you know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening to this, give it back. <laughs> no, no, no. no, 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 no. One. You can keep it. You can keep it. Um, I wanted something that, because with the old Herbalive, it was all like very bright colors. Like, oh, bright green, like bright orange and I just wanted something more classy because I wanted to give I wanted people to give our products a try without judging them so I'm like what's up and I just started um playing with logos designs and everything just so people are not like oh that's Herbalife like if I put the little Herbalife logo people would be like oh you're hell done no. like yeah, no, fine. Uh, so it's not that I'm hiding that it's Herbalife, but I want the people to try it first because me as an Herbalife distributor, I know that people think bad about like MLMs or like nutrition companies. So I always think about if I was the customer, like if I knew this was an MLM, I wouldn't go, right. you know, I'd be like, oh no, they're trying to recruit me. Like, no. But I just, yeah, I just started experimenting. I follow a lot of accounts on Instagram of shops like in New York, in Miami and seeing what's popular there. And I'm like, okay, what if I can make it my own and we can bring it here to Utah County where there is nothing similar. And, and there's, there's really not. Yeah. And, and I love that, that you said healthy Starbucks because that is, I mean, if you're listening to this, you may or may not have been to the spot, but that's literally what this is. It's healthy Starbucks. And there's just so much creativity behind it, which I think is, is really key in any business. So whatever it is that you do, you have to find creative ways. And I talk about this all the time. I have a dozen videos on this. You have to have creativity. And so, I mean, you guys have shakes and you have like, like cookies and cream and you have flan and you have masa pan and you have, I mean, all these different, awesome flavors that just really, really make it pop and make it and make it stand out. So talk to us a little bit about uh, kind of what the growing process has been going from, you know, just doing the MLM and now doing, doing a restaurant, which is a completely different marketing scheme and everything and kind of merging the two and actually making it work. It has uh, helped us grow so much. Me personally, like for example, in MLMs, I don't know about other MLMs, but you have certain numbers that you have to hit, like certain volume points that you have, ach have to achieve. This, the protein bar has helped us with that aspect of hitting the numbers. And that way we can focus on getting organic um, distributors like not just or organic clients, like not just trying to sell to whatever moves, you know, um, <clears throat> because we're buying so much product to make our drinks and 
um, for people to try them. And it's just so easy to bring someone over and have them try it. And if they like it, we're like, oh, well, you can either come every day, which will be more expensive, or you can get your membership and just have a discount and buy it to have at home. So oh, it's so just- you guys have a membership, a membership structure as well. See, I, I didn't even know that. So that's, that's an added layer. So tell us a little bit of, about that, because that to me is super interesting. Yeah. So people like if they like it, they can get it's like a $40 membership and they get like 20 percent um, discount of all the products and they can just have them home because I, I'm real with people. I'm like, I love that you come here every day, but if I was you, I would buy it to take it home because you're going to save more money. And I break down the prices. I'm like, this is what you spend if you come every day to OVS versus if you get your membership and take it home. And I'm like, I'm, I would love for you to come every day because I like seeing you. But if I'm being honest, like you're going to save more money this way. Um, and I do miss people when they buy the products and take it home. Um, but... <laughs> You know, I'm just trying to help people out. Like, it's not just about like, oh, like buy my stuff and goodbye. I'm, I'm never going to talk to you yeah. again. Like it's, it's literally like making friendships, building a community and just being real. Like I'm not trying to, I don't see people with like dollar signs above their head. Um, I'm actually pretty shy on the business opportunity of this. I was telling you um, when we were prepping for the show, that I don't invite people to the business opportunity or invite them to buy the product when they come to OBS. Like I'll, if they like the product enough and I see some interest, maybe I will casually like let them know like, oh, you can also take it home. And when I show them, show them the canister, I can explain a little bit more about it, but I never want people to feel that they're being harassed or like I'm on top of them like, oh, join my MLM, like get rich yeah. with me. Like, no, no, yeah. no. Like yeah, that's, far, sure. that's far away from my actual goal. Like I just honestly want people to try it. Awesome. Awesome. And you know, if we, if we talk about more, you know, business structure, I love what you mentioned that you guys have to hit a certain quota of product that you have to buy. And so the idea of saying, okay, if I have to sell, X amount of money in protein shakes, instead of trying to go out and sell X amount of money in protein shakes, I'm going to turn the protein shakes into protein waffles or protein bowls, consume what I need to consume. That way I have to buy more. So I make more money on that end. And then I'm going to sell the product to monetize on that end. Plus I'm going to sell memberships to monetize the people that want to come even more. So if we look at this, from just a business economical perspective, you've taken one uh, income stream and you've turned it into multiple. So that is really the dream of any entrepreneurs. I talk about this all the time. It's not about having one business. It's about having a chain of, of, of different businesses. So, you know, again, that's why I was so fascinated by it because I understood the concept. You know, as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, okay, I know what they're doing. They're, they're, they have to hit their PV numbers. So they're using all that product to then make stuff that they can sell them that looks cool. So as soon as I saw it, I was like, these guys, these guys are clever. Like that, that is a really cool way uh, to look at it. So I, I think that is absolutely awesome. Uh, and so you, you talked a little bit about uh, your partner, Charlie. So here I kind of wanted to, to throw this in because I think that it is so important to have the right person in your life. It's not um, life or death because I do know a lot of entrepreneurs that are single or entrepreneurs that, you know, and they can still be successful. But at the same time, you know, when you have someone in your life that motivates you, that inspires you, that gives you ideas, for example, he, you know, I know that he's a, a really handy guy, so he can build stuff and do stuff and, you know, so, and at the same time, give you ideas and give you that, that accountability. The specific question I wanted to ask you is sometimes it gets tough when you have couples running businesses, because at some level you have to hold each other accountable and you have to coach each other. Right? So how do you guys make that work to the point where the business doesn't cause relationship issues when you have to coach each other or keep each other accountable? 
it's honestly been a learning experience because I had never had this kind of support, like um, what Charlie brings to my life. Usually when I would see people post about it, like on their Instagram, like, oh, like he's my number one supporter, brings um helps me keep me accountable and i was like oh that's nice until it happened i'm like oh it is really nice but it's what you meant (laughs) because they're always grilling you and it's like and he's from argentina and they speak very loud like he will be talking normal and i'm like oh why are you yelling at me he's like no i'm just talking to you um it's been honestly a learning experience how to how to accept criticism and um what's the other word for it construct yeah constructive criticism and ideas and suggestions because since I have never gotten that before it's almost like oh like you're you're stepping all over um my bubble or oh you're being too rude like yeah cheer for me but then when it gets down to like the hard stuff, like, stay back. Like, no, like, it doesn't work like that. Um, what have we done? He, j- We just talk, we just talk about, well, he talks about it, I listen. <laughs> um, and I don't know, to be real, it it's hard. It's hard um, running a business with your significant other because you know, you're always with them. And if there's like a business problem or there's ideas that you are not aligned with, then there can be some friction. But I, when we get into like arguments about business, I step back and I'm like, okay, is he telling me this because he hates me? Or is he telling me this because he wants me to be better? You want and I'm to like, okay, he wants me to be better. I'm going to take the criticism. You're right. I think that's honestly what always helps me um, because I'm very sentimental. So I'm always like crying when he tells me like that I need to get work harder or go talk to like more people. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, okay, he uh, he has pushed me this far. If he keeps being like this, then we're going to get very far, because if it was up to me, I would just be comfy on the couch, not doing anything. So I do like having uh, him um, hold me accountable to things, even though it is really hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. And I think that I think that you touched on on the key, right? The reason why maybe a partner can can get on you a little bit is because they want you to win, right? Um, and they know that you're capable of doing it. And that that is something that, that that I've also learned. I mean, sometimes your partner sees things that you don't see yourself, and so. But if you, if you put up a wall or you think you know everything, then it's not going to work, right? So it does take a lot of humility to, like you said, take a step back and say, you know what, what, what they're saying, it's because they want me to win. And so mm-hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that in a positive way. I'm going to digest it, process it, and then do something with it. Um, I think that that, that that is an awesome, awesome trait. So uh, we're out of time, Magali, but I want to thank you so much for being on the show. Honestly, you know, I've learned so much and, you know, I think that some of the, uh, the key takeaways before, uh, I give it up to you for, for, for those closing tips is just guys, like no matter where you're at, if you work hard, you're going to win. You know, it doesn't matter if you just, if you just got here from another country, if you don't speak the language, if you don't know anybody, you go out, you have your product, you talk to people, you knock on doors, you believe in what you've got and you're going to win. And if you sprinkle a little bit of creativity, the right people around you and a little bit of fire, then you can build something awesome like you have done. So Magali, just like every other guest on the show, I have two questions at the end. Number one, what are your top three takeaways for somebody that is watching or listening to this that wants to do what you do? And last of all, how can people find you? How can people connect with you and try your amazing waffles? Um, something that they can take away is just give it a try. Um, it's better to be like, okay, I tried and it didn't work for me than to be like, oh, if I would have done it, maybe I could have gone somewhere far. Just do it. Just try it. You don't lose anything. 
everyone else is already starting their business and especially now in like the coronavirus time and social media it is so much easier to sell because everyone is always on their phone looking on instagram tiktok just go with the trends oh is it popular to make a tiktok twerking okay well twerk with your product <laughs> Just adapt. Twerk with your product. There you go. Twerk with your product. Make that money. <laughs> adapt to the trends, but also make it your own. You know, you don't want to be just some robot that copies exactly what the other person is doing. People will buy the stuff from you because of you, not because of the product. Like, yeah, the, the product that you're selling will maybe is like the best ever. But people buy stuff because of you, of how you are, how you present it. People are interested in what in what you are, basically. So be you. Be original. Be you. If you're shy, be, be shy, but get out of your comfort zone. Um, if you're serious, then you're serious. You know, you don't have to be like a funny person to try to sell. So be you. Just do it. Try it. Um, a place where people can find me um, on Instagram, our protein bar is called Orem Vida y Salud, um, or OVS for short. Um, you can find me on Instagram at M-A-G-G underscore zero. Um, come over to OVS. We're open seven days a week. If I'm not there, my parents are there in the mornings. They will treat you with lots of love. Um, everyone that comes through those doors, their family. So come visit us, try it. I know you'll like it. <laughs> you will guys. You really will. It's actually, it's actually quite dangerous. Like you go, go try it, but be, be prepared to like, want to go there every day. So I'll, I'll leave it that. Uh, but uh, Magali, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. So guys, reach out to her. Um, one of the things that I ask all of my guests is if there's somebody out there that has a question, if you're in Herbalife, if you're an MLM and you have a question, um, Magali will make herself available. Hit her up. Uh, she'll, she has a ton of knowledge, as you guys already learned. But with that being said, guys, thank you so much for tuning in to episode number 38 of the Ask Tony Show. Share this. Pass it on. Until next time. Thank you.